بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان ودعا بدعوتهم إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين وبعد Brothers and sisters, this is our fourth lesson from the Tales of the Two Cities. And the topic that we have today is Faith through Quran and Prophet. Faith through Quran and Prophet. First of all, uh, what we're going to discuss today is uh, two exclusive aspects of Islam, which serves as undeniable uh, proofs for its authenticity, the Quran and the Prophet. So we're talking about the Quran and we're talking about the Prophet wasallam. The Quran and the Prophet are both independent proofs. You know, we have the Quran as evidence, and after that, we have the Sunnah. They are both independent proofs. So, Rasulullah also said uh, in his uh, final khutbah that we talked about it in Arafah, if you remember. When we were in Arafah, I read out the khutbah, and he said that, Taraktu fikum amrain. I'm leaving behind two things. As long as you hold on, to the, hold on to these two things, then you would never be misguided. And he said, Kitabullah wa sunnati. He said, one of them is the book of Allah, and the other is my sunnah. So the Kitabullah and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu they both of them are undeniable, two independent proofs. So today we'll be looking at, inshallah ta'ala, in details, why do we hold the Prophet of Allah to be a proof, and what about the Quran as well? So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you need to understand that people uh, who, for example, why did Khadija believe in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the beginning? It's not because of the Quran. She never understood revelation. When Quran was revealed, Iqra bismi rabbika ladi khalaq. It's not because of the, uh, the clarity of the verses that Khadija said, yes, this is the word of Allah. I am no. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala and who he, he had Iqra bismi rabbika ladi khalaq. But we don't find in the books of Hadith, it's because of the verses of the Quran that Abu Bakr said that, yes, the books are very powerful. I mean, the words of Allah, subhanAllah, is very powerful. And he was stunned by the clarity of the verses, not because of that. Abu Bakr and also Khadija, Ali, and many others, why did they accept the Prophet of Allah وسلم, to be the Prophet? It is not because of the Quran. It is because of the characteristics of the Prophet they, they knew that the Muhammad وسلم, he doesn't lie. The Quraysh, they were fully aware of that. That Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he doesn't lie. They used to call him Sadiq, the truthful, Amin, the trustworthy. So Rasulullah sallallahu this is what he did. The first thing the Prophet of Allah وسلم, did was what? He called everyone, he gathered everyone, and then he went, uh, you know, the Safa mountain. You know, when you go to Safa and Marwa, now you'll understand this. The Prophet went to the Safa mountain, and you could see the some original pieces and traces of Safa is still there, right? Those of you who went to Safa. So the Prophet them he actually climbed the mountain. And when you climb the mountain, you will see everyone. Everyone is together. Basically, you could say, uh, the media of the time of Rasulullah sallallahu was that. You know, how do you pass the message by bringing everyone together in one platform? There's only one way to do it. That is, in the Jahiliya days, they used to have a word called Ya Sabaha. The word Ya Sabaha is a cry to gather everyone. It is, as I said to you, that's the media. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he took advantage of that. And he went in the mountain, he climbed the mountain, he went at the top of Safa. And they all gathered into the corner. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Sabaha. And this is the cry to gather everyone. When you say, Ya Sabaha, everyone knew that there's something about to happen. Something bad. Some musibah. Some sort of problems. Some sort of uh, calamity is about to befall. And they were aware of that. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Tell me, if I were to tell you that Sabahakum wa masakum, that there is a, an army is behind me. Now they can't see. The people remember they are at the bottom of the hill. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he could see what's behind him. They can't see. He said that if I were to inform you that behind me there is a, 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 a you know, an army is about to attack you. They could attack you in the morning or evening. Would you believe me? They said yes. Because here is a man, they're looking at a man here. They can't see what's behind. And he could see, so they have to believe in him. And secondly, he's not going to lie because he never lied before, so why would he lie? 
He never lied before, so why would he? So they said, of course, anta sadiqun, anta aminun, you are the truthful and you are uh, the trustworthy, so you are the reliable one. We have never experienced, ma jarrabnaka kadiban. We have never experienced in our life that, you know, we have never experienced you as a liar. For 40 years and six months, I've, we've never seen you lie. You lived amongst us, you, you grew up amongst us, we never see. They said, yes, we would believe anything that you say. So Rasulullah said, then you have to believe that I am a messenger of Allah. And I, as, if you do not believe in them, that, that I am the messenger of Allah, then a punishment is about to be, you know, about to fall. Now, people were stunned. They were speechless. Why? Because they knew this is the truth. Suddenly, Abu Lahab appears and he says, Tabban laka sa'ir al-yawm. Ali hadha jama'atana. You know, woe to you. And may your whole day be ruined. You know, is this why you gathered us here? And then he told Abu, Abu Lahab, said, everyone go back. Now, obviously, he insulted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the congregation. And one of the sunnah of Allah, that if you insult the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in congregation, in a gathering like that, Allah is not going to let you go alone. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, Tabbat yada. You know, because he said to the Prophet, Tabban laka. You know, your whole day will be ruined. Woe to you for the rest of the day. Allah revealed immediately, Tabbat yada Abi Lahab. Wa tab. There's two times where Tabba is repeated here. Tabbat yada Abi Lahab basically means the hand of the both hands of Abu Lahab is perished. Wa tab. So Tabbat yada, may the two hands of Abu Lahab be perished and it has already perished. The first one, is a is is is, a, is like a dua is a curse and the second one is a complete statement that it's not something that we're anticipating unless it's already happened you know when you say may you never walk that's just a you know curse from you it might not happen it might not take place isn't it you tell someone that may you never speak to me again yeah so allah said may the two hands of Abu Lahab be perished. So there is a possibility it might not happen again. Allah said, what tab? And this is not just a wish, it had already happened that Abu Lahab's hand is perished. So this is one of the proof of the Quran being authentic because what Abu Lahab could have done, he said, really, is that what the Quran says about me? That I'm going to be misguided, I'm going to be in the fire of hell, bear witness that I am a believer. Abu Lahab could have said that, isn't it? I am a believer, I believe in Allah. If Abu Lahab could have said that I believe in Allah, then that means the Quran is speaking untrue. The, sp the Quran is not correct. But Abu Lahab, he lived after these verses. He heard the verses from the Prophet's mouth. He heard the verses from the com companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu mouth. But uh, he never uh, took heed. Because Allah Azzawajal already told us about the characteristics of Abu Lahab. So anyway, uh, what we learn from this is that the entire Quraysh, in one word, they said that, Oh Prophet Muhammad, you never lie. So the Prophet Sallallahu is because of him, you know, he had this amazing conduct and behavior and characteristics before the prophethood. In Arabic, this is called Dala'il al-Nubuwa. It's called what? Dala'il al-Nubuwa. Basically, proofs of prophethood. Every single prophet, they go through this period, by the way. Every single prophet, before Allah Azzawajal chooses them to be a prophet, they have signs in the community that everyone they recognize them that this person is going to be someone or something special. There's something about this, and this is what, by the way, uh, Abu Lahab, uh, sorry, Abu Talib said this. Abu Talib, and before him, Abdul Muttalib as well. Abdul Muttalib, he looked at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once and he said, you know what, I see something. There's some, for example, Abdul Muttalib. Don't forget who he is. He is the custodian of Makkah, Kaaba. He was the leader of entire tribes. And because of his seniority, everyone is to respect him. When he sits, everyone should sit, you know, like a, a little away from him, giving him the space that he needs in, in respect. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi he was really young. He would come and run and jump onto the shoulder of his grandfather Abdul Muttalib, and they say, ah, "What is this young boy doing?" They should grab him and say, "No, let him go. This boy, just let him go. There is something about this boy." Inna li sha'nan. Ibn Hisham mentioned in the Sirah. This is the authentic book of Sirah. Sirah Ibn Hisham, he says that Abdul Muttalib used to say this every time. He said that Inna li waladi sha'nan. There's something amazing about this young boy. I could see the signs of him being something special. 
And then when Abdul Muttalib passed away, Abu Talib said the same thing as well. That inna li hadhal waladi sha'nan. When they came to Syria, when they came to Busra of Sham in Syria, they looked at uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the monk called Bahira, he came and he said, there's something about this young boy, this 12 year old boy, there's something about him. He said what? He said, basically, he sat down under a specific tree and believe me, no one sat under this tree except a Prophet. And I saw the cloud giving him shade. And I also saw the leaves moving towards him. They were leaning towards him so that he gets shade from the sun. All this, Abu Talib said that, you know what, there's something about him, you know. There's some significance, uh, there's, there's something about uh, this young boy that I've also been witnessing as well. So, this is called Dala'il Nubuwa. Basically, early proofs of this uh, prophet for the Prophet Wasallam that he will be the Prophet of Allah. So the companions, they didn't believe in the Quran in the beginning just by the, because of the verse of the Quran. They believe in because they knew the Prophet of Allah he doesn't lie. And this is why the Prophet of Allah, he himself is an evidence. Anything that he says is an evidence. And later on the Quran came and confirmed that. So this is the first point that we'd like to make that Rasulullah Wasallam he himself is an evidence. Then the next point that I would like to make is that later on, whatever the Prophet of Allah said, whatever the words that he spoke and the advice that he gave, people found clear truth in those advice. Not only clear truth, the way the Prophet of Allah spoke to the people as well. And there are a few things that I would like to, for you to note. For example, when a person looks at the message of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam with an unbiased mind, prepared to accept the truth, he will find that the nature of the message itself is convincing. Some aspects are listed below. For one, it establishes the oneness of Allah. When the Prophet of Allah he speaks, you, could, you know, the Prophet of Allah is establishing the oneness of Allah with clear sign that they cannot argue against it. The Prophet of Allah will say something and he will give a sign and he will say, you know, give examples. Sometimes the Prophet of Allah uses similes and metaphor and the message they get that Allah is one and no one else can produce anything like what the Prophet of Allah has produced in such in a concise as, as such little words. It's called Jami'ul Kalim. The Prophet of Allah used to speak very little yet the meaning is to be like, like ocean. It's called Jawami'ul Al Kalim. Second thing is explain the purpose of life. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi is advised to explain the purpose of life. The third thing, details of the details, the rules of worship. You know how you pray, how do you go to ruku, how you go to sujood, what do you do, how you call to Allah, and it's all perfect. And then one, one, one more thing, when the Prophet of Allah is advising, is giving us guidelines, nothing contradicts. You don't find contradiction. You know, you don't find that the Prophet of Allah is saying something that you do in sujood and then he contradicts that in next salah is completely different. You know, we human beings, when we keep on giving guidelines, sometimes we say that, you know what, this is a mistake because previously you said something different. You don't find that in, in the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa You find clear instruction. Yeah? Fourth, provides guidelines for good dealings. Fifth, Encouragement to adopt good manners and character. Fifth, guidance for social and political justice. And next, we have equity and equality and human rights. Rasulullah he covered all that in hadith. And there are many others, by the way. This is just a few examples. So later on, we're talking about the disbelievers. Okay, they looked at the words of Rasulullah They looked at the hadith and they studied all this and they said, you know what? First of all, we found out that he never lied. For example, Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan, he met the Roman Empire once. The Roman Empire, he met him. They called, in, in, in Arabic, they call him Hiraqal. In English, they call him Heraclius. He met him in Palestine. Yes, he met him there. I think it was the year 1630 or 1629. Sorry, 629 or 630. Basically, a year before the demise of Rasulullah Wasallam. And Abu Sufyan was asked that, what do you think of Muhammad? Abu Sufyan said that, uh, what do you want to know? He said, does he come from a good lineage? He said, yes, he does. His lineage is, uh, is very pure. You know, we have no problem with that. The next question they asked, he asked, is he a liar? He said, no, he never lied, so I can't. And people were telling Abu Sufyan, go ahead. Because if you make things up, we're going to have the whole Roman uh, army with us. And then we could defeat and, uh, you know, the Muslim uh, in totality. Because, you know, the Romans, they were known for battles and etc. But Abu Sufyan said that the two reasons, I could have lied, and he later on revealed that I, the reason I couldn't lie is because 
everyone in my on that day all the people were with me every one of them they knew that Muhammad has never lied if I were to say something and make things up they would then they would say what kind of leader Abu Sufyan front of other leaders he lies about his own people and then they will belittle me that's what Abu Sufyan said and he said and secondly it wasn't my 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 conduct my behavior to lie as well so anyway what we learn from this is that uh, the Quraysh they couldn't they couldn't make things up they couldn't lie and you know and they knew about the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that whatever he's saying is true so then you will say that why didn't they become muslim well it is hasad jealousy and it is because they don't want to lose their power they don't want to lose their position and many other things as well also we need to understand now we have understood that why the prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he himself was a proof because of his behavior because of his manners because of his upbringing because of his characteristics because of his good conduct and etc etc now what about the quran why is the quran became all of a sudden a proof to the disbelievers also is because why we would we would like to look at a couple of things first of all the quran is the most prominent proof of the prophethood today after the whole quran was revealed it became its own proof and its power and relevance became eternal today people became muslim just by reading it due to not knowing arabic most people today are oblivious to its linguistic miracle which swayed so many arabs during the prophet's time yet they are moved by the power of the message and this is enough for them to want to look at the religion further uh, if i if you could allow me to relate what happened uh, at the time of quraish basically they didn't know what to do they didn't know how to challenge the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they didn't know they thought what shall we do here because this man is spreading islam and this man is basically you know there's got a lot of followers so they called the most knowledgeable man in the whole of arabian peninsula by the name of utba ibn rabia they called him so they called utba and they said to him utba we need your help this is not written in your uh, notes by the way i don't think it is anyway so they called utba and then they told utba that look we need your help utba said what what is it he said first of all you are the most knowledgeable in poetry utba said yes i am he said you are the most knowledgeable in m m m m magic you know he was a sorcerer as well he said yes i have the skills of you know i i am master of master of sorcery and magic as well he said you also are well versed in kahana kahana basically means fortune telling he said yes we also he said yes is that true he said basically what happened is we have someone here called muhammad he said yes and he claimed that he is a prophet and he claimed that you know uh, the quran that he recites is actually the word of um, Allah, what of God? We would like you to test him. He said, "Oh, there's something else you missed about me." So what is it? He said, "I'm a shair. I'm a poet. So I would know. Basically, language is my tools, and simile, metaphors, and all that stuff, personification. These are stuff that I use in my poetry. So I will know if he's making things up. So I, a poet will know another poet." You know, so people of excellence, they know other people. So he said, leave that to me. I'll, I'll sort, out, sort this one out. He comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa It's a long story, you have to cut it short. He comes and he goes to him that, look, uh, I would like to speak to you because Quraysh have sent me. Is it true that uh, you, uh, you uh, actually narrate, uh, I mean, a Quran is revealed to you. Is it true? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said yes. And then basically he challenged the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, look, you have divided us, you have done this and etc, etc. And then the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, look, now you have spoken for long, allow me to speak. Let me say something. Then he said, yes, go ahead. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he did, he recited some of the verses of uh, Surah Sajda. Hamim Sajda, Alif Lam Mim, Alif Lam Mim, Tanzeelum Min Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Kitabun Fussilat, sorry, it was Hamim Sajda, if I could say, Hamim Sajda basically means Hamim, Tanzeelum Min Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Kitabun Fussilat, Ayatuhu, Quran Al-Arabiyyan, Liqawmi Yu'minun, and the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he read, he continued reading, and this person, he is very good with language, when the Prophet of Allah said, فَإِنْ أَعْرَضُوا, if they turn away, O Prophet Muhammad, he, the Prophet of Allah is still reading the Quran. Nothing else. He never said anything. He just read the Quran. فَإِنْ أَعْرَضُوا, فَقُلْ أَنْذَرْتُكُمْ صَاعِقَةً مِثْلَ صَاعِقَةِ عَادٍ وَثَمُودٍ. If they turn away, O Prophet Muhammad, then you tell them 
I have already warned you about the lightning and thunder that will fall on you just like it has fallen on the people of Samud and Ad. And the Arabs were aware of Samud and Ad because it happened in the Arabian Peninsula, you see. They were have, have in Madain, which is not too far away from them, in Median. So they exactly knew about uh, Samud and Ad. So he said, that's it, hasbuk. Please don't read anymore. I've understood your message. You don't have to say anything else. The Prophet didn't invite him. The Prophet didn't say anything of his own word. All he did, he recited the Quran. He comes back, Abu Jahal and everyone else in a gathering near the Kaaba, drinking and waiting that today we have sent the most knowledgeable man in poetry and also in sorcery and in kahana, in fortune telling and you know, everything. Okay? He will defeat the Prophet وسلم, and we will live happily ever after. Suddenly he comes. Abu Jahl looked at him from far. He said, mm, لَقَدْ أَتَاكُمْ مِنْ غَيْرِ وَجْهِ الَّذِي قَامَ مِنْ عِنْدُكُمْ I see that there's something has happened to his face. He's, not, he's a different person today. You know, something has happened to him as well. He has, he's coming back with a different face that he left from here. And then he said, يَا مَعْشَرَ Quraysh." Utbah is speaking to the, uh, the leaders of the Quraysh now. He said, O oh, people of Quraysh, أَطِعُونِ الْيَوْمِ just listen to me for today and then you don't have to listen to me the next day. Just for today, believe me. He said, لَقَدْ كَلَّمَنِي مُحَمَّدٌ بِكَلَامٍ Muhammad spoke to me today with such word, مَا هُوَ بِشِعْرٍ وَلَا سِحْرٍ وَلَا كَهَانَةٍ By Allah, it is not poetry. It is not fortune telling. It is not the words of any magician. It is something else. إِنَّ لِقَوْلُهِ الَّذِي يَقُولُ لَحَلَاوَ وَإِنَّ عَلَيْهِ طَلَاوَ he said, the words are very sweet and the meanings are very vivid. And he said, you have to listen to him. You should obey him. If you don't want to obey him, then let him go. Leave him alone. Don't try to challenge him because if you do, then you will ruin. Then if you do, you will be destroyed. Because I've spoken to him, I've tested him out. They said, look man, we sent you to defeat him. What has happened to you? Saharaka. Looks like he has bewitched you as well. And obviously then they went away. So what we're trying to say, this is a proof. A man who went to challenge the Prophet وسلم, a well-versed in every field that he was at that time. And he said, I'm telling you the truth that Muhammad, he, whatever the Quran that he's reciting, it is not the word of any creation. So the Quran is also a proof. It is because of this very nature of the message carried in the Quran, that despite extreme opposition from Quraysh as well, and even in our time as well, the mass media, uh, if you look at the mass media misrepresentation, yet, subhanAllah, Islam still remains one of the largest and the fastest growing religion in the world. And it will. And because the Prophet of Allah وسلم, already gave another prophecy, which we will talk about inshaAllah ta'ala. So, Rasulullah وسلم, he was passing the message of the Quran. Suddenly, the Prophet of Allah وسلم, for the very first time, he met the people of Medina uh, in a certain year. Rasulullah وسلم, he met them uh, on the 12th year of Nubuwa. Basically, you could say the Prophet of Allah at that time was 52 years of age because he received revelation at the age of 40. So 12 years later, when he was 52, he met the people of Medina for the very first time. Suddenly, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was in Mina. You know, we went to Mina, everyone. Remember Mina, Muzdalifa, Arafah, yeah? So, and those of you in my coach, I showed you where they met the Prophet in Aqaba, okay? Uh, there were three Jamarat, Jamaratul Ula, Jamaratul Wusta, and Aqaba. And I pointed toward that, right at that area, that's where they met uh, the Prophet of Allah, he met them. Sallallahu alayhi wa He was in Mina, anyway, that's all you have to remember now. He was in Mina. The Prophet of Allah وسلم, he was going to every tribe, talking to them and telling them that I am a Prophet, listen to me. I have the words of Allah, reciting the Quran to them. No one was listening to him. Some even physically abused the Prophet وسلم, not just verbally. Suddenly, some people of Medina, there were only seven of them by the way. They said, yeah, sit down. He said, oh people, will you allow me to sit with you that I could convey the message of Almighty Allah to you? They said, yes, sit down, we will listen to you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then he narrated them who he is. He said, look, Allah has sent me with the, with, with the revelation, Quran, and he recited some of the verses. He invited, the, invited them towards Allah. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said something. He said, look, if you say, la ilaha illallah, tuflihu. Qulu la ilaha illallah, tuflihu. If you say, la ilaha illallah, you will be successful. And they said that, and what after that? He said, I guarantee you that you will enter paradise. 
So they say, you are a Rasul. He said, yes. Then suddenly they said, give us a little time to ruminate. And then they were talking to each other. He said, hey, this person is a Rasul? We heard about Rasul. Remember in Medina, we have Jews there. And the Jews, they told us. So this is another reason why the Prophet of Allah is a hujjah, is evidence. Because the Jewish people, they were anticipating that a Prophet would come. This is what they have found in Torah. He said, do you remember the people, the Jews, they were warning us. They were telling us that, oh, Aus and Khazraj. These tribes were from called Aus and Khazraj, by the way. Aus and Khazraj, they were the largest tribe in Medina. But they were fighting one another. And they became very weak in number. When they became weak in number, you divide and conquer, the Jews came into power. And they said, so they became weak, Jews came into power. And then the Jewish people should say to Aus and Khazraj that you have to be subordinate to us. Because if you don't, a man will come. He will be a prophet. We will follow him because we have the signs to recognize him. And he don't have the signs to recognize him. We will follow him and then we will defeat and crush you. So they said, it is our chance. Since he's speaking to us first, we should take the shahada. We should become Muslim and we will be with him and we'll defeat the Jews. I know it is the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They said, yes, we believe in you. After they done the mashura, they said, yes. You are, you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allahu Akbar, he was so happy because this is the first time someone outside of Mecca said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka Rasulullah. This happened in Mina, in the scorching heat of Arabia, after so many tents, khaymatan, khaymatan, he was yatajawwalu min khaymatin ila khaymatin, min khaymatin ila khaymatin, he was going to one, you've seen so many khayma, this, you know, so many tents in, uh, in, in Mina, this kind of tents was also, in the, not in the normal that we've seen, but in the different types of khayma was even at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he was going from there. You know, how long it took us from one area to get to the other area where I delivered that khutbah of the Prophet The Prophet of Allah, he walked to all these areas, inviting everyone in the scorching heat of the Arabian Peninsula. Suddenly the Prophet of Allah was so happy that this is the first time someone believed in him. So what we're trying to prove from here is very simple, that people were already talking about Rasulullah The Jews were already aware of the Prophet They were already aware of the description of the Prophet And also, Aus and Khazraj, they got to know about the Prophet in Medina because of the Jews, because of the uh, Christ, Christian and Jews, because of Ahlul Kitab. So you're going to say, if that's the case, why the Jews, they didn't accept Islam then? They've got all the signs. They knew, how they, by the way, they were aware of the appearance of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They knew how he would look. And to prove that, just very quickly, when the Prophet went to uh, Syria, he went to an area called Busra, Busra of Sham. Okay, it's not the Busra of Iraq, Busra of Sham. When he went there, uh, the Bahira, the monk asked some, uh, a lot of questions. And one of the questions that he asked to Abu Talib that, is he, is he called Ahmad? Abu Talib said, yes, but we call him Muhammad. He said, okay, his father has passed away. Look at the description. He's not asking him. Abu Talib goes, no, I am the father. Abu Talib had to do this because he was really worried that this guy know <laughs> every information. He said, no, I'm the father. He said, Kadabta, you're lying. You can't be. This is a man, his father has to be, he has to be an orphan. His father has to die. Abu Talib said, look, you're scaring me. But the truth is, yes, his father has passed away. But I am, I'm like a father to him and I'm not going to let any harm happen to him. He said, look, I'm not going to cause any harm. I've recognized him. I know who he is. He is Muhammad, Akhirun Nabi. I've been observing him. I've been waiting here. I've been waiting here for a long time, looking. I've been told that uh, the, uh, the prophet who will be a prophet, he will come from this way. And I've been told everything about him. I find it in the book. I'm telling you, Abu Talib, send him back because if you continue your journey, the Jews will kill him. Abu Talib, he sent the Prophet Sallallahu back straight away. He said, you need to go back. And he sent him. And then Abu Talib he finished his business transaction. So, and then he joined. So ev even that kind of description, the lineage of the Prophet Islam, the height of the Prophet Islam, and about the char characteristics of the Prophet Islam, and also about his family details. His father will pass away. His mother will pass away. All that was mentioned in Torah. And more will be revealed to you very soon. So why didn't they accept Islam then? Anyone would like to answer this? They had all this. Yes, please. 
That's right. Because only thing is jealousy. They were racist. They wanted him to be from Banu Ishaq. You know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his lineage goes to who? Ismail. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, lineage, as I told you before, is Muhammad, Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Abdul Muttalib, Ibn Hashim, Ibn Abdul Munaf, Ibn Qusay, Ibn Kilab, Ibn Murra, Ibn Ghalib, Ibn Fahar, Ibn Malik, Ibn Kinana, Ibn Khuzayma, Ibn Mudrika, Ibn Ilyas, Ibn Nazar, Ibn Ma'ad, Ibn Adnan. And Adnan is unanimously agreed by everyone that he is from the children of Ismail. No one, even the Jews, Christian, everyone agrees with that. And that's the lineage of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they were like, oh dear, what? He is a prophet, but he's not from Ishaq. He's from Is Ismail. So because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned, hasadan min indi and fusim. Because of that jealousy from them, they rejected Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But not everyone. Many Christians, many Jews also accepted Islam. And we're going to talk about them inshallah ta'ala. We're going to move on. And I'm going to give you only one example because the rest you have to read yourself. Example of people who believed in the Prophet ﷺ by the proof of the prophecies they found about him in their books. One of the stories that I would like to read to you is here. If you could read, look at this one, the Najashi, number two the story. The Prophet ﷺ, he sent a letter to Najashi. Najashi, he was the king of Habasha, Abyssinia. Does anyone know his original name, by the way? Because everyone called him Najashi. You see the Arabs, they, I mean, uh, anyone who was a king of Abyssinia, they used to call him Najash, or Najashi, or Negus. Yeah? Anyone who was from Kisra, as in from Persia, any, any, any ruler from Persia, they used to call him Kisra. Anyone, any ruler from the Roman, they used to call him Kaisar. So you have Kisra, you have Qaisar. Anyone from Egypt, they used to call him Pharaoh. So any king from Abyssinia, they used to call him Najashi. So what was his name? Anyone? Anyone from the sisters? Anyone from the brothers? He was called Ashama. A-S-H-A-M-A. -A -A. He was called Ashama. So Ashama, because the reason I'm mentioning this name, because many other uh, king of Abyssinia was there. So we don't want to get, you know, we want to find the, actual, the one at the time of the Prophet Because after Najashi passed away, another one came. So this is why we're talking about this. So Najashi, he was called Ashama. The Prophet wrote to him, calling him to Islam. This letter was delivered to Najashi by the Prophet's cousin, Ja'far bin Abi Talib. When he reached, and by the way, uh, Najashi, was, he was a Christian. When this letter reached Najashi, he found the contents of the letter and he read the letter and then he said, Ashhadu, I testify by Allah that he is the prophet that the people of the book are waiting for. So he already knew that the people of the book are waiting. The Christians and the Jews is written in the book, in the scripture, that a prophet will come. And he said, that is him. And I'm the first to accept. And Najashi became Muslim. Why? Jafar didn't invite him. He just read the Prophet ﷺ letter and he read the contents of the letter and he said, Yes, he is a Muslim. And in other narration, uh, he actually had a debate with Jafar and he spoke to Jafar. And when Jafar recited Surah Maryam, he talks about Jesus and about the Virgin Mary and about the, uh, about the you know, miraculous birth of Jesus and about the, you know, uh, the fact that uh, the, uh, the conversation happened between Mary and Angel Jibreel. He found all this and he said, you know what, everything that you are saying, whatever you are saying and whatever Jesus told us is coming from the same light, same lamp. And he said that basically another was saying that what Jesus said is true and what Prophet Muhammad said is also true. So I'm accepting both up to be the prophets of Allah. And the rest inshallah ta'ala you could read. So we could, from this we could understand that not everyone was jealous and angry. There were people who have accepted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa merely on the evidence in the previous scripture. We're going to move on, inshallah ta'ala, and we would like to look at the mu'jizah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is the meaning of mu'jizah? Okay, mu'jizah is something that is logically possible. We have to understand this. It's logically possible, but beyond normal human powers and against the norm, normally understood rules of cause and effect. So it's, it's possible. It is possible, maybe logically, for someone to walk on water, but it's... It's not normal. That's called mu'ajizah. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He blessed every single prophet, by the way, with the mu'jaza. Because they will do this and people will accept Islam. That's the whole idea. So, every single prophet, we can't name all the prophets and all the mu'jaza. We would like to mention a few. For example, Salih alayhi salatu salam, the mu'jaza Allah blessed him is that when he was inviting, they said, Oh Salih, we're not going to believe in you. Unless you command this rock to deliver a she camel. That's like... What a, what a stupid question. How does a rock deliver? The rock that can't give birth. And they say not only give birth, it has to be a she camel. So Salih alayhi salatu salam, he said, okay. He prayed to Allah azza wa jal, and then suddenly a she camel, behold, appear in front of a large people from the rock. And then only obviously uh, Allah azza wa jal talks about this in various surah. Uh, in, in various surah Allah talks about, about this she camel. Uh, Musa alayhi salatu salam, you know, throughout his whole life, the marriage that was taking place, everyone knows. Okay, one of the, the two that Allah mentioned in, 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 like in, in various chapters is that uh, when Musa alayhi salatu salam came into uh, front of Pharaoh, and then uh, Musa, uh, Musa alayhi salam, first of all, sorry, when he, met, when he went to meet Allah in, in, uh, in Tur, Mount Tur, Mount Thur, Musa alayhi salam was asked to draw, you know, throw down his staff. فَأَلْقَاهَا فَإِذَا هِيَ حَيَّةٌ تَسْعَى The moment he threw, uh, threw down his staff, his uh, stick, he turned into a snake. And then Allah Azza wa told him that, Oh Musa, you should grab it again. Musa was really worried. That what, you know, and then the moment he grabbed it again, it became into a staff. So that's also a, a, a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was a miracle uh, that Allah blessed Musa Islam. Then he said, وَضْمُمْ يَدَكَ إِلَىٰ جَنَاحِكَ Oh Musa, you should put your right hand onto your bosom, onto your, onto your armpit. Okay? وَضْمُمْ يَدَكَ إِلَىٰ جَنَاحِكَ تَخْرُجْ بَيْضَىٰ And then when Musa Islam should do this, you guys have to look at this because you might not understand. What Musa Islam should do is take his right hand and he should put it under his armpit like that. And then you take it out, and then his hand is to become like a torch. So those days there was no torch. So now Musa alayhi salatu salam, his hand is shining, and is to basically illuminate the whole area. And is to tell everyone that look, and everyone is to be looking at it. It's like light coming out the hand of Musa. He said, ayat and ukhra. Oh Musa, this is another sign that you are the messenger of Allah. This, these are all mu'jaza. Similarly, Isa alayhi salatu salam. Subhanallah, Allah blessed Isa alayhi salam with so many mu'jaza. This is, and there's a verse written here, and if you could allow me to translate this. It's, the translation is written here as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, oh, uh, about Isa alayhi salam. He said, remember, when Allah will say, oh Isa, oh son of Maryam, Remember my favor to you and to your mother. Remember my favor to you and your mother. When I supported you with Ruh al Qudus, Jibreel, so that you spoke to the people in the cradle and in maturity. Can I stop for a second? Allah says that you spoke to the people in cradle. Babies, they don't talk in cradle. So that's a mu'jiza. You know, you have to wait for a certain years. The moment some, Isa alayhi salam, the moment Mary delivered, Isa alayhi salam, he spoke to the mother. This is in one narration. فَنَادَاهَا مَنْ تَحْتَهَا If you have to do sabah qiraat to understand this one, you know. In the Quran, in the Quran, that, uh, the Quran that we recite, it said, فَنَادَاهَا مِنْ تَحْتِهَا Basically, someone called beneath Mary. Basically, a voice came out under Mary. A voice, a voice came out saying that, you know, you know, saying that, فَكُلِي وَشْرَبِي وَقَرِّ عَيْنَا Allah uh, tahzani that do not worry. Qad ja'ala rabbuki tahtaki sariya Allah has created a stream under you. Because you know, after the delivery she was really weak, you know, she delivered a child, she was very weak, she has lost a lot of energy, a lot of blood, and she was very weak and she was you know so much pain that she was going through, she said that Ya Laitani kuntu nasiya mansiya. I wish that I was totally forgotten. I wish I was dead. She hoped that she passed away before that. Ya Laitani mittu qabla hadha. I wish I was dead. Wa kuntu nasiya mansiya and I was totally forgotten. So then a voice came under her, some said the voice of Jibreel, saying that, calm down. You know, be cool, relax, you got water. Shake the trunk of the palm tree, it will give you fresh days. So you got the days now, which has a lot of fiber, a, a lot of uh, you know, energy. Have the days, have the water, and get back the energy again. But in another uh, narration, uh, in Qira'ah, it is said what? 
It said that Fanadaha man tahtaha. The child that she delivered, that child called, saying, The mother, you don't need to worry. So she looked at the baby, that my baby, you know, uh, every mother will expect, would, would, would like that to happen. The moment you deliver the child, if the child starts talking to you, amazing. Do you understand? You just look at the child, you forget all the pain. And you know, this is something that every father they treasure, the moment you pick up the child. And then, do you understand that it's, it's, it's just amazing feeling. Okay, only the father and the mother would understand this. Okay, now here, she's not just holding the child, the child is talking to her. This is a miracle. But the Quran says that is not the miracle only. The miracle is that uh, Isa, Jesus, spoke to the people in the cradle and in maturity. So the question is, what does that mean? Every one of us, we speak in maturity. How is that miracle? Would anyone like to answer this question? Did you understand the question? He said, he said one of the miracles of Isa, he spoke in cradle and he spoke in maturity. Speaking in maturity, how is that a miracle? That's one of the answer. The, one of the, sorry? So when he was speaking, he wasn't speaking uh, gibberish. You know, he wasn't saying goo goo gaga and all this kind of stuff. Do you understand? He was speaking like a mature person. He was speaking like an adult. But there's another hikmah behind it. There's another answer. And this is the most important one. No. No. Anyone else? He was talking like an adult when he was young. That's a miracle, yes. But there's a in the Quran has all all sort of indication why Allah said that wa yukallimu nasa fil mahdi wa kahla. He will speak. He didn't say that he's speaking like an adult. Quran didn't say that. That's the understanding that we get. You have to understand Arabic language. Okay. Quran didn't say that he will speak like an adult when he's young. Quran didn't say that. Quran said wa yukallimu nasa fil mahdi. Wakahala. He will speak to the people in cradle and in maturity. Two different era. Yes, sir. That's the answer we're looking for. To show that he will return again in maturity and he will speak to the people. It is about the second coming of Isa That's the indication that we get. So that's also another miracle. And he said, and I taught you the book and wisdom and Torah and the gospel. So can you see, Isa salam, he was another miracle that the books that wasn't even revealed to him, he was aware of all these books as well. And in addition, and how you shaped of clay the figure of bird by my permission. Subhanallah, is to grab sun. You know, sun is to grab a ladder in his hand. And he said, فَيَنْفُخُ فِيهِ And then suddenly, he's to make a bird out of it. And the bird is flying out. And people say, did you see this? He said, yes. He said, بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ this has happened by the will of Allah. So do you now believe me? I'm the, and I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Prophet, and many is to accept him. This is also a miracle as well. Not only that, it said here, and he became a bird by my permission, and you healed him who was born blind, and the leper by my permission. You know, they had no cure. At the time of Isa Islam, they were advancing in medication. You know, everyone wants to, be, wants to become a doctor, but there was no cure for the, 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 the one who is a leper and the one who is blind. You know what Isa used to do? That's the, another reason why he was called Masih. Because Masaha Yamsahu means to pass hand. You know, when you, when you do Masa on the head, when you do Wadu. Okay, what do you do? You do Masa. When you wear leather socks, what do you do? You do Masa. So this is the reason why he was called Masih. Because someone who is blind, Isa used to do Masa on on his eyes like that. And the moment he's to remove the hand, the person is to get vision. He sees. He goes, subhanAllah, I could see. I could see, yes, this is a red curtain. Yes, this is a green curtain. Yes, I could see. Suddenly, and he said, Islam said, it happened because of the will of Allah. And he's to remind them every time. It's not me, it's Allah who's doing this. And then the person, you know, he's got leprosy, and he knows that he's got a very bad skin. Islam will touch it here. Suddenly he's got fresh skin. So these were the miracles of Isa والسلام, that Allah has blessed him with. Not only that, if you could continue to read, he said, and how I restrained the children of Israel from harming you. They came to attack him, kill him. Did they kill him? Did they assassinate him? Did they hang him? No. 
they didn't. وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِينًا Allah says, certainly they couldn't. But رَفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ Allah raised him to the heaven. And when you came to them with clear sign, and those of them who disbelieve exclaimed, this is nothing but clear magic. Similarly, there were miracles by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Many, many miracles. I don't have, unfortunately, the time to go in detail. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's miracle is so many. But you see, the other prophets, when the prophet passed away, the miracle went with them. Now, the, when Musa sallam passed away, he left behind no miracle. When Isa sallam passed away, no miracle. When uh, Dawood sallam passed away, there was no miracle. When Shu'ib sallam passed away, there is no miracle. So each prophet, when they passed away. There was no miracle. When Muhammad was not passed away, he left a miracle. And the miracle is the Quran. And what's the miracle of the Quran? The message of the Quran. What's the miracle of the Quran? The language of the Quran. And that's the most important thing that I would like to mention. The language of the Quran. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He revealed the Quran to the people. But who were the people? The people, Ashabul Fasaha. They were the people of rhetoric. They were the people of eloquence of tongue. They're the, they're the people they used to make poetry on the spot. They never used to prepare. You know the poet they have to think, isn't it? They never used to think. They never used to think. And one of my teachers has told us a story about a young boy that um, his father said that I don't want you. I don't think he's my son. Take him away and chop his head off. They said why? Because look, I'm a poet. My wife is a poet. My, gr my father was a poet. And you know, my grandfather was a poet. All my other children are poets. But this boy, I think he's Waladu Zina. I don't think he's my child. Because if he was, then he would have been also an expert in poetry. Take him away. From this you could understand when the Quran was revealed, what kind of people they were. So they took him away. And then he said that, I want you to chop his head off. Don't bring their body. I want to behead him. They took him to the wood. And when they took him to the wood, the boy spoke and he said, Qifa, nabki min dhikra habibi wa manzili, bisikhti liwa bayna dakhuli fa haumali, fatudiha fal miqrati lam ya'fur asmuha, lima nasajatha min janubin wa shamali. Up to there he spoke. And then later on he finished it. Tara ba'ar al arami fi arasatiha wa qayaniha, ka'anna hu habbu ful fuli, ka'anni ghadat al bayni yoma tahammalu, lada samurati al hayi naqi fu hamvali, vukufan biha sahbi alayya matuyuhum, ya kuluna la tahlik asan wa tajammali, wa inna shifa. And you know it's called Qasida Lamiya of Imra ul Qais. He came back. Father said, What are you doing? I don't want the whole body, I just want the head. He said, Master, listen to the boy. This boy is just not he's not just talking about poetry. This boy is a master in poetry. On the spot he spoke to us. He said, Kifa, stop. Let us remember the beloved. Let us remember the beloved, but let us remember the house. Let us talk about them. The house that is occurred between Liwa, Bisikht Liwa, which is in Dakhul, and then after the Hauman. These are the places no one even traveled there. This boy knows about these places as well. You know, in the olden days, they never used to travel. But the traveling used to be very difficult. He's naming, basically, he was aware of the geography of the places that no one went there. He was aware of the description of the places. So he's not just guessing. He goes, first of all, you have Liwa, then you have Dakhul, and after that, the Haumal comes. You know, he was given in order. For example, I'm from the area. You have, uh, you have Forest Gate, and then you have Manor Park, then you have Ilford. East London, okay? Sorry about this. This is something. So he was mentioning this in detail. So they realized that, you know, he knows all that. People who could make poetry, and not only poetry on the spot, these words are very powerful, by the way. That people who came later on, they relied on his poetry to get poetry out. For example, like Imam Ashatbi, rahimahullah, he wrote a book of poetry about Tajweed, but he followed the lamb of Imra ul Qais as well, except instead of Kasra, he gave a Fatha. And just Imam Ashatbi said, Bada'atu bi hamdillahi fil, Bada'atu bi hamdillahi fil nazmi awwala. تبارك رحمن رحيما ومولا وثنيت صلى الله ربي على الرضا محمد المهدى إلى الناس مرسلا وثلث بأن الحمد لله دائما وما ليس مبدوا به أجدم العلا. so instead of kasra he gave a fatha. then later on a time came another poet came he's called Asmai. again he related the article the lamb of Imam Imra ul Qais. And he said, for example, صوت صفير البلبل هيج قلب الثمل الماء والزهر مع مع زهر نحذ المقلي. I don't have no time, so I'm not going to say any more. So every one of them they used to make poetry. Quran was revealed at that time. So when the Quran was revealed, they were looking at the Quran. They said, this is not poetry. 
In poetry, they follow certain measure. Quran doesn't follow any measure, but it's better than poetry. You know, in poetry, you have to bring one word, and then you have to clarify the word in the next sec next misra, although you won't make any sense. You know, every, and, and then you have to bring the same harf or rawi, the same letter, ending letter. If it ends with lam, you have to end in lam as well in all the way. But the Quran is not doing that, yet it's still rhyming. So they said no. Inna a'tayna kal kawthar. The small, one of the smallest surah is Inna a'tayna kal kawthar. He said, Inna a'tayna kal kawthar. Laysa hadha kalam al bashar. He said, even the smallest surah of Inna a'tayna kal kawthar, that is not even the word of any creation, let alone like Surah Al Baqarah and Surah Al uh, Sajda and etc. And, et and they gave up. They said, no, this is. Rasulullah also told them that this is not the language only. The Quran is challenging you people. Quran said that if you truly believe that this word is not the word of Allah, then produce something like the Quran. Come on. The first verse Allah made it easy for them, by the way. Allah said, Look, Fatu bi ashri suwari muftarayatin, wadu uman istatatu min duni lahi in kuntum sadiq. He said, Look, just produce 10 verses. 10. 10 chapters. Not the whole Quran, 10 chapters. But they couldn't do it. Then Allah said, قُلْ لَا إِنِ اجْتَمَعَتِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنِّ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لَا يَأْتُونَ بِمِثْلِهُ وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُ لِبَعْضٌ ظَهِيرًا Look, they can't bring anything like of the Qur'an. Even if they were to get help from the jinn, not only human being, even with the jinn, call the jinn, call the human being, call everyone besides Allah and tell them to produce anything like the Qur'an, they cannot produce anything like the Qur'an. Then Rajah then Allah made the matter more easy for them. He said, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ If you're still in doubt, مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا What we have revealed to our servant Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ Bring only one surah. Not the whole Qur'an, not ten, one surah only. One chapter. One. Bring one surah like the Qur'an. فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ Call all your witnesses. Besides Allah, bring more people if you want. In kuntum sadiqin, if you are truthful. Then Quran says something really amazing, by the way. It praises the Arab as well here. A lot of people don't know this. He said, فَإِلَّمْ تَفْعَلُوا If you can't produce, because you are the people of knowledge, you are the people of eloquence, of, you know, you are the people of rhetoric, you are the people of lugha. If you can't produce, then you shall never produce. No one will be like you. If you guys can't do it, learn. The word lam to negate the past in Arabic language, by the way. And the word lam to negate the future. Basically means if you can't bring something now, then till the day of Qiyamah, no one will bring anything like the Quran. So the Quran is praising the Arabs as well at the same time, by the way. And obviously the door is open, even today. And Allah said it, those, they had their language we don't even have the language today even the arabs today have, have forgotten many arabic words today you know imam al-asma'i he used to be the master of the arabic words that the arab they hardly could remember he used to remember all these very difficult words okay we don't have asma'i in our time so if they couldn't produce it who's going to produce anything like allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that this is another sign that the quran is the book of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is just a lugha, language. What about the message of the Holy Quran? The message of the Holy Quran, there are many. I'm going to take only one because I really want to finish it now. Message of the Holy Quran are many. Subhanallah, many, many. Allahu Akbar. One of them is this. Rasulullah sallallahu when he went to uh, Mi'raj, when he traveled from Mecca to Palestine, at that time, at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi it takes a month one month to travel to Palestine. One month to travel, one month to come back. The Prophet of Allah comes and he tells the Quraysh, I was uh, in Palestine yesterday, last night. They said, well, where did you go? I went to uh, Masjid al-Aqsa. One point here I would like to mention, a lot of historians, they make this mistake. Uh, I've made this mistake as well. Uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the contemporary historians and biographers and Sira books is that they believe that there was actually a masjid that in building. There was no building, by the way. Okay, there was no building. It was just a, just a earth, just a field. Okay, it's very important because it is one of the plan of the Zionists that we will say the dome of the rock is not. First of all, they said to everyone that dome of the rock is Masjid al-Aqsa. So everyone, you've seen so many posters, Masjid al-Aqsa, you get dome of the rock. That happened from 1980 till year 2000. 
And then, mashallah, you know, some brothers like friends of Aqsa and many other groups came in. They educated the people, saying that that's not Masjid al-Aqsa. It's Masjid al-Aqsa is actually the other one, the one with the black dome. Well, hear from me, none of them is Masjid al-Aqsa. Masjid al-Aqsa is the vicinity, it's not the construction. Because if your eyes go to the Dome of the Rock, they will destroy the other masjid. When your eyes go to the other, they will take the land. We are talking about the entire vicinity. Okay, the whole, that is Masjid al-Aqsa. Because, one evidence, currently in Masjid al-Aqsa, because I went there, as you know, in Masjid al-Aqsa last year, and currently only 5,000 people could pray there. How many prophets prayed in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? 124,000 approximately. If you use the entire vicinity, then it's possible, otherwise not. Okay? This is one thing that I would like to remember. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he came back, he told them all this. When he told them this information, uh, Abu Lahab said, very interesting, he was very sly. He said, this is very interesting. I like what you have done. So you went to Aqsa. I said, yes. And he came back in the same night. He said, yes. Abu Lahab thought, this is a fantastic chance for me to make him a liar in front of everyone. He said, you know what? I'm going to gather everyone and you tell them what you're telling me. Yeah? The Prophet said, okay. He gathered everyone, Abu Lahab. Because he was very influential. You know that. He was called Abu Hakam. If Abu Lahab calls, everyone will come. Everyone came. He said, go ahead, Muhammad, narrate this. And Rasulullah sallam told them the whole story about his night journey from Hatim, uh, from Mecca, from Kaaba to Masjid al-Aqsa. From Masjid al-Aqsa, he led the people in Salah. Then he went to the heaven. He spoke to Allah. He saw Jannah and Nar, etc. Then he descended and the angel descended with him. And then he traveled by Burak and he came down. Okay, and back to Mecca and back to the bed, etc. It was the physical ascension of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not just spiritual, as some of the modern contemporary scholars they try to say. I'm not going to mention who they are. Anyway, it's the physical ascension. We have to believe in that. Okay. Rasulullah, one of the evidence is very easy. Because when the Prophet of Allah told them, that I went, that's what they found. They did not, why did they reject the Prophet Sallallahu Because it wasn't possible for someone to do a journey which takes a month to go, months to come back within a few hours. That's why. That's, the, you know, that's what they found surprising. If someone says, yeah, it was a spiritual journey, I felt I was there, there's no need to deny. Yeah, I feel this every night, brother. Anyone could say that, isn't it? So I don't understand why Muslim scholars, they have become the victim of the Orientalists. I just don't understand this. You know, those of you who have probably seen so many programs on TV and you heard them saying that it was spiritual, it wasn't physical. It was physical. That's the whole thing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then they questioned him. How could you say that Muhammad? You've been to Masjid al-Aqsa. It's not possible. The Prophet of Allah said, why? He said, okay, then tell us the gates of Masjid al-Aqsa. And that time, there was no windows and etc. It was only the gates. Even today, inshallah, if Allah gives you tawfiq, you know, that's my... That's the latest research that I have done. I've studied Masjid al-Aqsa, the history of Masjid al-Aqsa from the time of, uh, of Rasulullah sallallahu till our time. The gates are still there, various gates. The paths, they're, they're, they're paths and etc. You've seen probably in the picture, they're massive stairs. Yeah? They are original from the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa From the time of Bukht and Nasr and etc. And so pillars were there as well. So the Prophet Sallallahu he gave them the geography of how to enter Masjid Al-Aqsa. How? The Prophet of Allah said, I was, kunt, I was very worried. Because they were questioning, tough question. They said that how many gates, which way do you go inside? Which way the door is closed? How do you go to the, what's the western gate? What's the eastern gate? What's the southern gate? And all this kind of stuff. You know when the, uh, some of the scholars of the subcontinent, they read these hadith, they thought the Prophet was describing the masjid. So they said, oh, what color of the window? What about the mihrab? What kind of verse was written? None of that. The only thing is mentioned in Sahih hadith is that the Prophet said, when I looked, suddenly I saw Jibril. Jibril is waving at the Prophet, don't worry. There you will ask question, you just look here. فَجَلَّ اللَّهُ لِي بَيْتَ الْمَقْدِسِ Allah made the entire Bayt al-Maqdis appear in front of my eyes. The Prophet was looking at Bayt al-Maqdis. It's just there. It's very easy for us to understand. Because I could sit here and I could, you know, by the use of Skype, I could speak to my wife directly. 
isn't it? And uh, the whole, my house will be here, and I could tell you, you know what, I just came back from home, I have this many, etc. I could describe what kind of color clothes their family members are wearing. So you have to believe in etc. isn't it? So this is what happened, Jibril, but the whole Baytul Mufti is in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then the Prophet said, Fasirtu asifu lahum baban baban. I began to describe them every single gate. That's the translation. Not color of mimbar and mihrab and carpet and etc. This is uh, all additional so that we understand. It was a good intention of the scholars, but they made a mistake there. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said this. <coughs> they were stunned. You know why? Because Quraysh, they used to always go to Baytul Maqdis. You know, for business transaction, they used to go to Yemen and Sham. On, by Sham, Damascus and Baytul Maqdis. So they were away. So they're looking at Abu Sufyan said, I'm speaking the truth. Abu Lahab goes, that's true as well. And they just didn't know what to And the Prophet of Allah said, your caravan, by the way, they have, they're in a certain area. They will reach, the, reach home in three days' time. They reach exactly on three days as well. All this kind of stuff has happened. And the Quran was so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quranic verses. They thought the Quran is lying that the Prophet didn't go. Rasulullah sallallahu challenged them. And so the message of the Quran as well. That the Quran already told them what they thought is not possible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it possible. That's one. Another thing is the, the, the battle of the Roman and the Persian. I have to say this. I was not planning to. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in his time, uh, that battle took place. You know, Persian, they defeated the Roman. Persian, they defeated the Roman. And um, when that happened, uh, Quran was revealed. Quran revealed that Alif Lam Mim, Ghulibatul Rum, Romans were defeated. Fi Adn al Ard in the nearest land. Wahum Mim Ba'di Ghalabihim Sayaghlibun fi Bidu Isinin. He said, and they, after they are defeated, they will be victorious in few years. This is the key word in few years, Bidu Isinin. Now, <coughs> Abu Bakr went to someone and he said, you know what? Uh, I know the Persian have defeated the Roman, but the Roman will defeat the Persian. He said, don't, be, you know, he goes, don't, I'm not going to listen to you. Why? Because A, it is not possible because Persian, they are more, they, in, in, in terms of controlling the land, they have more land in geography. They have more manpower. They have more weapons. They have many other things as well. Roman, they are very small. The only thing they have is Constantinople, nothing else. Everything was taken away from them. How is it possible for them to defeat this large army? A worker said, I, put a hundred, I bet you a hundred camel that the, that the Romans will defeat the Persian in three years. You know why? Because the Arabic language, the word bid'a means three till nine. And Abu Bakr with his ishtiyad, he thought it's going to happen very soon, so he said three years. He came to the Prophet and said, oh, Prophet of Allah, I had a bet. And that time betting was allowed, so don't even ask any question after that. It was allowed, later on it became haram. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, what did you say to him? He said, I said in three years, you know, Muslim will be, uh, sorry, the Persian, they will be uh, destroyed and Roman will be victorious. Because it's in the Quran. Quran is telling us something that will happen later on. Rasulullah sallallahu said, no, go back to him and bet him 200 camels. But don't tell him three years, say three to nine years. Because Allah didn't say. The word bidr is from three till nine. He came back and he said, look, he said, what? But you're gonna, you know, you've already given up. He said, no, 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 I want to add more camels. He said, no problem. He said, 200 camels, add 200 camels. But I would like to change, I would like to rephrase. He said, go ahead. He said, it's not gonna happen in three years. It's gonna happen between three to nine years. He goes, it's never gonna happen, so no problem, I'll believe you. When the Muslim migrated from Makkah to Medina, it was the Battle of Badr. And this is something very important. And again, a lot of uh, scholars, they didn't translate this verse correctly. Even here as well, uh, this is not my note, this is Sheikh Shamsul Duha. He didn't even mention this as well. So, inshallah, he will get to learn this as well. Inshallah, not a problem. It said here, if you could kindly look at this note, it said, The Romans have been defeated in the land nearby, but after their defeat, they will themselves be victorious in a few years' time. The affair is Allah's from beginning to end. On that day, can you please underline this? On that day, Yawmaidin yafrahul mu'minun bi nasrillah. On that day, the believers will rejoice in Allah's help. Underline this. Why will the believer rejoice on that day? If the Roman defeats the Persian, what do the Muslim get out of this? Romans are disbelievers. Persians are disbelievers. They are both criminals in terms of rejecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why would the Muslim will be happy? Yes. Is it because they are in support of Abu Bakr is going to get 200 camels? No. Because that's, you know, uh, 
That's not something that you know Abu Bakr is going to get. No. Why did Allah mention on that day Muslim will be victorious? I mean on that day, sorry, what is it? The believers will rejoice in Allah's help. Anyone? I actually hinted, isn't it? I should have rephrased that, you know. Because on that day, battle of brother took place. And Muslims, they didn't know this as well. They didn't know, they, mind, they couldn't comprehend that Allah already told them that they will, be, they will be victorious in battle of Badr. And they were really worried. Allah already told them, don't worry, you will win battle of Badr. So what happened? When they returned home victorious, 313 defeated 1,000. And they were so happy. The, happy. the happiness was about to increase. Mr. Williams, the happy was about to increase. What happened? They came home, suddenly they get the message that, guess what? So what? He said, the Persians were defeated and the Romans were victorious. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already told us that on that day we will rejoice. That is our victory itself as well. So we were victorious and Allah told us before the battle as well. It's just that we, could, we comprehended this a little later on. Quran, and Abu Bakr went to the guy, 200 camels, my friend, quickly, because it happened within seven years, not nine years. Seven years later, and they couldn't be. But that guy, you know, very sadly, he didn't become Muslim as well. You know, he just couldn't believe the fact. Anyway, Allah Azza wa Jal has hikmah. So what we learn, the Quran reveals so many. And now the same Quran telling us about the end of the world, tells about Jannah and Jahannam. So, to summarize, brothers and sisters, Rasulullah Sallallahu was a hujjah, who was evidence himself because of his conduct, because of his speech, because of his manners, because of his appearance, because of the ways to walk and talk, because of his characteristics. One. Secondly, the Quran was evidence because of his language, because of the message of the Quran. This is why we believe in Allah's Messenger, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we also believe in the Quran. This is why today we talked about faith through Quran and Prophet. May Allah give us the tawfiq to follow, uh, to, to read the Quran correctly. To pronounce every letter of the Quran accurately, so we should do all that tajweed course basically. Secondly, we should read about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam biography and tarikh and seerah, so we'll, we get to know more about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we should study seerah, and also we should study shama'il about the appearance and about the conduct and behavior of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The more we will study, inshallah, the more love of Rasulullah and more love of the Quran will come to us. May Allah give us tawfiq. And with this, I will end my speech. If you have any question totally related to the topic that we're in, you may ask, inshallah ta'ala. Can I get some uh, water, please, if it's possible? Yes, I'll, I'll try my best. Yes. Absolutely. Can I just stop you one second there? I can't carry on, you're just saying what I'm going to say. Say it, go ahead. The brother asked the question, the Jews had accurate information about the appearance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you're talking about, about his height and etc. That's very difficult. Okay, we have this topic in Medina and I don't want to take, take the light away from Sheikh Zahir Mahmood or Sheikh Shams duha Anyway, they might be lecturing. Uh, Quran says something, this is very important. It said, يَعْرِفُونَهُ Look at the way Allah, he said, the people of the book, they know Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, يَعْرِفُونَهُ Just as they know their own children. Any father here, can you make a mistake when you look at your child? Because, oh, that's not my... If every father knows the appearance of his own child, no one has doubt about their child, especially after they have grown, you know. Allah says, this is how they would know the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But why they didn't accept Islam? Again, hasadan min indi anfusihim. It's because of the hasad. Yeah? So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was a bi tawil in the common hadith. He wasn't too tall. Yeah? Laysa bi qasir, he wasn't too short. I was about to give two examples of two individuals, it's not fair. Anyway, what well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wasn't too tall, he wasn't too short. That's the only description came. They don't talk about their foot or etc. So we can't go into that detail. He wasn't too tall, he wasn't short, he was a man uh, of medium height. Allahu Alam. Yes, sister. Is it true that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No, the Prophet Sallallahu he did have a shadow. He did have a shadow. Uh, people exaggerate a lot of things. The Prophet he did have a shadow as well, yes, he did. 
It's just that, you know, uh, people mention this because if the Prophet have a, have a shadow, then everyone's going to run into the shadow and etc. You know, no, the Prophet he also had a shadow as well. Yes. Anyone else has anything to say? When miracles occur, again, um, you said, you know, you said miracles are some of the prophets. And we know that the prophets have to come now. And when we say this about when we do, when we appear, and so will they, will they come in miracles? Will what they do be classed as miracles or will they just be... Okay, the brother's question is that uh, you said there will be no more prophets to come, but whoever will, if the prophet, uh, there will be no more prophets to come. But we know that Isa al will come and Imam Mahdi will come. First of all, Imam Mahdi is not a prophet. We know that, yeah? Secondly, Isa al will come. Would he do the miracles as well? Uh, Isa al one of the miracles of Isa al is that his existence, you know, the, his appearance. His existence is a miracle itself. For example, the Quran, uh, the Hadith, the Prophet of Allah told us, yeah? That when the Jal will see Isa al Islam, Yadubu Kama Yadubul Milh, Ida Asab al Ma, then the Jal, the moment he will see Isa, then he will melt the way water melts salt. When you are salt into the water, the, the way it melts, that's how, so that's a miracle as well. The fact that Isa al Islam will be the only person to kill the Jal, that's also a miracle as well. So these will be the miracle of Isa al Islam, yes. And people will see all that. You know, Isa al-Islam will chase him, and the Prophet of Allah said, I know exactly in, at what location he, he will kill uh, the Jal, Babul Lud in Palestine. And that's basically an area where, at this present moment, majority of the Jewish people are living there. Yes? The same question. Okay, the question the brother asking, the question he's asking that Jesus, when he will descend, alayhi salatu wasalam, he will descend in Syria or Palestine, etc. Actually, there are two hadiths, and both of them are authentic. The first hadith, he said that, Yanzul Isa ibn Maryam, Inda Sharqiyya Dimashq, Yanzul Isa ibn Maryam, Sharqiyya Dimashq, Inda Al Manarat Al Baydah, that Prophet Jesus will, will descend. Uh, in the northern of Damascus, near the white minaret. I actually studied in that area, near the white minaret. So I should look up every time, and it's a beautiful minaret. The hadith is authentic because Imam Ahmad mentioned this. And all the chains of transmission is basically accurate. Therefore, we have to take this hadith into consideration. However, based on, on clear evidences, uh, and, and, and because of uh, another, we have other evidences as well. It makes more sense that he will be in Palestine. Both of the hadiths are same in terms of authenticity but the popular hadith is the aqsa one and aqsa one, make, one makes more sense because you know the people who rejected isa were the people who lived in that area so you'll come into the same area so you'll be a hujja evidence against them that you i was here i was inviting here i was raised from here and i came back here as well so that makes more sense that's all i could say this at this moment otherwise the hadiths are, are, are authentic it's very difficult to reconcile between them otherwise any more questions? Yes, please. Right. Because the Quran doesn't tell us, and because the Sunnah doesn't tell us, so we can't say this. But one thing that we know, she didn't have that nine month. She didn't have that long. Uh, Jibril, miraculously, he basically blew into her. And then she became pregnant by that. So the pregnant happened immediately. And then how long she, it, basically then she was asked to move away. You know, min ahliha makanan sharqiyya. Then she was asked to go in the Sharq. Sharq is eastern zone of Palestine. So I actually went there to see. And uh, unfortunately people say that he was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem. The geography and the Quran, if you take into consideration, it doesn't make sense. So I you know. So they say this one. Quran doesn't say this one, because you know, if you stand in Al Aqsa, then that's actually western zone, not not you know, not eastern. And Quran said she went to us Makan and Sharqiya, yeah, and then it continues as well. So anyway, uh, Isa al uh, Mary was pregnant for how many days? We don't know, but it was very less because she became pregnant straight away. And then she went in another area and she basically stayed there for a few days and then she delivered the child. She was on her own at that time, yes. She was on her own. She was asked to be on, she also, she desired to be on her own as well. She wanted to be on her own, yes. 
And uh, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you all of, and we're in Hudud al-Haram, so say Ameen. If Allah take you all to Masjid al-Aqsa, inshaAllah ta'ala, the area where she came back and suckled Isa is preserved. The area where she sat down in Atikaf is preserved. The area where she delivered the child, according to some resources, uh, is preserved as well. So you get to see all that and it's quite an amazing thing to see. Yes, anyone has, has any other questions? Subject related? <laughs> Go ahead. I'll come back. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, with Isa Alayhi Salaam, on his return, on his return, what would it be, as it says in the Quran, you know, Jitnakum, uh, 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 our, our, oh, go on. Go on. Jitnakum. Uh, we try and, uh, the thing, but you know, the, uh, I will call you back from, uh, from the Quran. That's what I'm sorry. فَإِذَا جَاءُ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ جِئْنَا بِكُمْ لَفِيفَةً In Surah Bani Israel. Yes, go on. Now, what's the, what's the purpose, what's the purpose of Isa at the start, not Christian Allah, but why would he do them? Why would Isa say, return them back? What, what would be the purpose? What is it about that? I think I answered this, no? I've answered this. Are you saying, why would Isa will come to that area again? No, no, no. no. Why? Quran answered that. Quran said that وَإِنَّ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِ That every single people of the book will believe in Isa alayhi salatu wa salam before he actually died. People didn't believe in him. They rejected him when he was raised to the heaven. But he will come again and challenge them and he will prove them that they were wrong, they made mistakes, and then they will become believers as well. So it's basically hujja, so that he becomes an evidence against them or for them. This was so because of this reason. And secondly, Allah says, Wa innahu la ilmu fala tamtarunna biha. And in Sabah Qira'ah, it means, Wa innahu la alamu One of the major signs of Qiyamah is the physical dissension of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. So these are the reasons, you know, why Isa al will come back to this area. The people who rejected him, he will challenge them as well. People of Bani Israel, people those were uh, of Yehud and Bani Israel, basically by Irq, by their lineage, and also by their conversion, both will have to basically surrender to the truth of Isa al Not everyone will accept, by the way. Many will still will reject him, and they will join Dajjal, and that's why they will all die together with Dajjal, and Isa will finish them all as well. Yes. Sorry, uh, there's a question from the sister first, I'll come back to you. Usually the sister, they don't ask any questions. Yes. Two questions. So, are you going to... Okay. All right. Thank you. Sister's question is, what is the meaning of mi'raj? Mi'raj comes in the Arabic language, araja ya'ruju, means to ascend. Mi'raj, in Arabic language we have something called Ismul Ala and Ismul Dharf. Ismul Ala means the meme of tools. You know when you say, when you give a meme the Kasra becomes the tools. For example, let's, this is very important, have a little Arabic language lesson. The word Fataha means to open. If you say Miftah, it becomes the tools to open, which is a key. Right? For example, and if you say Maftah, it becomes the place. Okay, so meme with the fatha area, place. Meme with the kasra, tools. Are we okay? So sajada means to prostrate. So masjid is the place of prostration. Okay, so we've talked about this. So mi'raj is from me. Mi. Mi'raj means the tool to ascend. Okay, so mi'raj basically means when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he traveled from Mecca to Masjid al-Aqsa, he traveled by Buraq. Buraq is an animal, uh, the Prophet said that it's, uh, it's, it's smaller, it's, it's, smaller it's, it's larger than the horse, uh, but smaller than the mule, okay, or, or vice versa, the Prophet explained, and he was so fast, his, his first step is whatever the eyes could see. That's why the Prophet of Allah, he went very fast. You know, you could say a conquer in our time. If, well, I don't, we don't have conquer anymore. Well, those of you know, we had conquer once upon a time. Anyway, that's how it's to travel. So when the Prophet went there, 
He, and that's called Isra. So the traveling is called Isra. When he went to Baytul Maqdis, people make a mistake again. They say that the Prophet, he traveled by Burak to the heaven. No, Burak wasn't there. He tied the Burak. Yeah? And then, basically, the two, two ascent came down. Basically, you could say escalators. Then the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he went to the heaven. He stood and the escalator took him. So the tools to make him go is called Mi'raj. I hope that answers your question, inshallah. That's just with language, that's all. Another question, yes. So, so uh, I, I, I wish, I hope I heard you. I think there are four things. First of all, there is a hadith uh, that says that Isa Islam will come and he will kill the pigs. That's one. Secondly, you said that he will? Okay, he will destroy the crosses. Two, yes, go on. And third, you said that? Sorry, say that again. He will have a, yes, okay, that he will marry and he will have children, live like a normal person, that's right. And the fourth, that, that he will be buried next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yeah? Four things, okay. Yes, every one of them is true. Uh, the fact that he, the question I repeated, no? The sister asked that, he, I've also read in the hadith that Isa Islam will descend and he will kill the pigs. What does that mean? It's symbolic, some of the scholars, they said that. He's not going to go find every pig and kill it. It's symbolic, basically mean killing the pig, basically abolishing the fact that it was never halal for anyone. Do you understand this one, sister? He will kill the pig doesn't mean he will gather all the pigs and no, no. Okay, so animal rights people could you know, live in, okay, no problem, you know. He, it's, it's symbolic basically means that it was never halal. He's abolishing the whole idea of people believing that was halal. He will finish off the cross because he never died in the cross. Why are you carrying? Why do you think this is sanctified? It's not sanctified, you know. And you know, one of the scholars of Islam, his name is Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya, student of Ibn Taymiyyah, he said that I don't understand even now why they think it's sanctified. Because if you died there, then the, you know, if, the, if you died in the cross, then that's a cursed thing. You don't carry around, it's, an, it's a place of punishment. You run away, you keep it away. How does you get, you know, what, what is this? So um, basically, uh, he will finish off the cross, basically means another thing saying that that whole idea of Trinity and the fact that he died in the cross was wrong, so again he's fixing them, basically. And the third thing that you said that he will live a normal life is because he is a Bashar, he's a human being. And every single prophet, they had wives and children, except for two prophets. One was Isa alayhi salatu salam, and the other is John the Baptist, Yahya alayhi salam. The Yahya alayhi salam, he was assassinated. They took him and they beheaded him and he couldn't, uh, he couldn't marry. And he won't marry, he'll get married in Jannah inshaAllah ta'ala. As for the Isa, because he will return and he will marry again and he will have children. That's right, he mentioned in the hadith. As for the last thing that you mentioned, that he will be uh, buried next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and there is space there. You're absolutely right, the space is there. However, the hadith that mentioned that he will be buried there is more popular but it's not authentic. The hadith is not authentic. A lot of people, they talk about this one. The chains of narration are very weak. We can't take that into uh, evidence. But when it comes to this kind of thing, sometimes popularity is more important than the authenticity. Because large number of people from the generation of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam been passing on. So it's basically scholars after scholars after scholars is passing on. And the space is also reserved as well. And we could, you know, uh, uh, you will get the chance to see this as well. So the hadith is uh, not authentic in terms of the change of transmission, however, it's popular. That's all I could say at this moment. I hope that answered the question. Yes, sister. That will be the last question from the sister. And there will be any brothers here? A last question from the brother because uh, it's tahajjud time, lady. Yes. Are you, talk, are you saying the Muslims 
or the dis are you saying the Muslim will turn away or the disbelievers not accepting which one or both? both. Basically, sister, Subhanallah. If you look at it, uh, the question is, uh, thank you, brother. The question is that Quran talks about so many signs and so many proofs about how the world will come to an end, and people will be seeing this with their own eyes. So, uh, uh, will the Muslims will become disbelievers or? Wouldn't the disbelievers will become believers by seeing the clarity and truth? Uh, this is very difficult to say. Well, one thing that we already have seen that people they saw the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Quran was revealing to him right in the front of their eyes. They still didn't believe. It was in their nature. People saw miracles. You know, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He stood once. It's in your notes. And they said, show us a sign. He said, okay, look at the moon. They all looked at the moon, and he split the moon into two halves. And they said, ah, that's magic. So there are some people, they are not ready to listen to the truth. To be honest with sisters, those people, if you speak to the revert uh, brothers and sisters, they will tell you why they accept Islam. And they will tell you what they have seen. There are many people that they are accepting Islam because they are look, reading the Quran now. Many people, they will tell us, I have accepted Islam because I read this verse in the Quran. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, he read Surah Taha. When he read Surah Taha, and he was very good in Arabic language, he couldn't read anymore. He started to cry like a baby. And he said, Fatima to his uh, sister, take me, to, uh, uh, you know, take me to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then uh, Khabbab, the uh, husband of Fatima came out and said, yes. He said, what, what? He said, I heard the Prophet of Allah praying for you. And so you will become a, uh, you know. So there were people, they read the Quran, they became Muslim. There will be people, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that um, every Prophet, they had a miracle, but the miracle came to an end after the demise, except for my miracle, it will remain till the day of Qiyamah. And therefore, I hope I will have more numbers of Ummah. So the Prophet told her there will be till the day of Qiyamah people will be accepting Islam. And subhanAllah there are people. Islam is the fastest growing religion despite the fact media saying other things against. Why? Because people actually they say that if they are saying all this about Islam let me read a little and the moment they read they become Muslim. So it's going to happen inshaAllah. Uh, last question brother. Sorry, say that again. There. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. No, no. Uh, the question is that the you uh, that I've mentioned in my talk that the Jews they were fully aware of the appearance of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Did they also were aware of the Mahdi? The promised Messiah, the Mahdi, did they also had uh, knowledge about his appearance? The answer is no, because the person who gave his uh, description and information was Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. No one else. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "A man will come. He will share my name from my lineage. Uh, he will speak Arabic and etc." And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he also named Imam Mahdi's father and mother as well and the lineage and everything. And he said that Allah azza wa jal will use him to correct the mistakes of many of the believers. So the Prophet Sallallahu he gave a lot of description about him. No one else did. No one else did. That was the last question. Uh, it's so interesting one yes. But after his question, Muhyiddin, you need to rephrase his question because I find it very hard to understand the Shaykh. Go on. Based on my uh, so the question is when Imam Mahdi will come, uh, will he uh, affirm uh, the creed and belief of the Ahlul Bayt or will he establish the Aqidah and creed of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah? But Imam uh, Mahdi, he's not going to come to challenge anyone. That's, that's what Isa Islam will do. Imam Mahdi is not here to challenge people. He's not here to debate anyone. Imam Mahdi's job is not any of that. Imam Mahdi uh, will come. Uh, don't forget, he will be a, he's one of the Ummah. He's not a prophet. He's just a normal human being. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him. He's just going to be a scholar. But 
he, whatever he will speak, whatever he will address, people can't go against him because he will, Allah will give him this kind of knowledge and wisdom. But there won't be no debate. No one will, when Imam Mahdi will speak, people are not going to debate. He's not going to shout to prove that he's Mahdi. He will say, people will recognize him. He will never claim to be, he won't say that, I am Mahdi, come to me. Come to, uh, he's not going to do all this kind of publicity. People will recognize him because of his appearance, because of his lineage, because the way he will speak. You know, Allah, that, this, kind of, this is the reason. And obviously, he will be a mushtahid. Always remember this one. He won't be following any madhab or anything. He will be a mushtahid. Mushtahid basically means someone Allah will bless him with knowledge and wisdom that he gets guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he will look at the Quran and he will look at the sunnah. And based on the Quran and sunnah, he will establish prayers and everything. So when people will look at Imam Mahdi, they will follow him. Because he's an imam, he's a mushtahid. When you have a mushtahid, you follow him. You know, one of our uh, uh, teacher once said something really interesting. They said that basically there was, a, there was a Hanifi scholar and he was giving so many details, evidences to prove that Hanifi fiqh is most authentic. So the student, they took this and he said, wow, that was amazing, Ustaz. If Imam Shafi was alive today, then he would have been speechless. So he slapped him on. He said, Bayquf. You idiot. If Imam Shafi was alive, all of us would have become Shafi followers. So when you have a mushtahid, you don't do ishtihad, you follow him. So when Imam Mahdi will be there, there is no following anything, you follow Imam Mahdi. So that's what's going to happen, inshaAllah ta'ala. He will be recognized in the haram in tawaf, yes. Because that's the meeting place by the Muslims, by the pious Muslims. And that is an evidence that we always, this ummah, no matter how, no matter how many uh, khubasa and khabis and transgressors and oppressors we're going to have, they will be pious people till the day of Qiyamah, till the end of the time. They're pious people, they will always remain. Inshallah ta'ala, their number would not come. They will be less in number, but it would not come to an end. So the brother said, Imam Mahdi, will he be recognized in, in Tawaf? Sunnah tells us yes. Who will recognize him? The pious people will recognize him. Inshallah ta'ala.